Good morning, and welcome to Seattle Atheist Church. Atheists, agnostics, free thinkers, whatever you like to call yourself, you are welcome here. At Seattle Atheist Church, we call ourselves an atheist church because you will never hear anything supernatural promoted from the podium. Our church is founded on the principles of scientific naturalism and secular ethics. Truth claims are attempted here, and we stand ready to revise our thinking in light of new information. We attempt to be excellent to all conscious beings, and we believe in good, because good works in non-mysterious ways. If that sounds right to you, you are probably in the right place. So thank you for being here. Um, I want to do a few announcements. So next week, our board games will be moving to Saturday. We're going to try out Saturday instead of Sunday at 3 o'clock at the Wayward Coffee House on 65th and Roosevelt. Um, also, uh, the we, if you'd like to support the church financially, there's a donation jar at the back of the room, or you can do so online. Those donations pay for renting the room and for snacks currently. <clears throat> Uh, the, we are meet here every Sunday at noon in this room. The members ourselves give the talks, and when we have a planning meeting, everyone will be invited uh, to come. So think now if you would like to give a talk. So without further ado, uh, come on up, Scott. I didn't expect so many people. Uh, I feel like a rock star. You guys aren't going to start a mosh pit on me, are you? <laughs> Well, I'm going to fight through this cold a little bit and talk a little bit about the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact. And it's related to the Electoral College, and it's, it's just a means of putting a fork in it, getting rid of it. But I'm going to talk about the Electoral College a little bit. Can you hear me now? Yeah, All right, better. So <clears throat> I think most of us know what the Electoral College is, but in case you don't, uh, the major intentions of the Electoral College, uh, where's my other slide? Pardon me while I mess with my, huh, things got rearranged. All right, here's the Electoral College. So, people don't realize that when we vote for president, we're really not voting for president, okay? We are voting for the Electoral representation that actually follows through by voting for our presidential candidates, all right? So the President of the United States is not elected by the popular vote, and we vote for a slate of electors that represent the voters in each state, plus Washington, D.C. It used to be that Washington, D.C. didn't have any electoral votes, but that changed with the 23rd Amendment in uh, 1961. And the number of electoral votes that each state or D.C. gets is, is one for each member of the House of Representatives, which is 435 total, and one for each senator. So each state has two senators, and uh, that's 100 total. And Washington, D.C. has a total of three, which gives us a total of 538 total electoral votes, which you can infer from that that in order to win the presidency outright, you need to get 270 electoral votes, the, uh, the majority. <clears throat> so when we vote, and actually in some states, I don't think this is true in our state, the name of the elector is actually on the ballot when you cast it. And it also says the presidential candidate's name. And um, the electors, after the election, they meet in their respective state capitals in December and cast their votes. And uh, if a majority of electoral votes are not cast for any candidate, the president is elected by the House of Representatives, which is something I didn't know, with each state getting one vote per congressional de delegation. Kind of interesting. They vote amongst the top five candidates. Now, uh, well, let me go back. Uh, the 23rd Amendment uh, was ratified in, oh, I already said this, in 1961 and gave representation uh, in the EC to Washington, D.C. So, why do we have an electoral college? I mean, wh why do we not have just a direct popular vote? Well, there's a couple of reasons, okay? 
It was thought, um, for one thing, we have an electoral college for the same reason that we have a House and a Senate, okay? The Senate, each state gets two Senate senators, and they also get a House of Representatives that is proportional to the population of the state. So the reason for that is because early on in the Republic, people were concerned that larger states, like, like Georgia, or perhaps New York, okay, or uh, Virginia, would dominate uh, the election, okay, over smaller states like Rhode Island, okay. And so it was, it was a compromise to have a proportional house, but each state has its representation of two senators. So we have an upper and lower house. It also was thought to provide a buffer between the common man and those that are elected, especially people like Hamilton who were very interested in this. I think you have to look at it kind of in the context of the times because most people didn't know how to read, okay? Many were slaves, okay? And they really weren't well-educated enough, it was thought at the time, to really have the wisdom to vote for our leaders. So it's a way of putting a layer between the common man and the educated man, okay? Now as a consequence of that, I think it's a logical consequence. Of course, slaves couldn't vote, women couldn't vote, okay? Who could vote? White male landowners. That's who could vote. And those were the people who were educated at that time, too. So it's, it's not just a simple equation of sexism or racism. I think largely it's because these were the people that, uh, were felt to be qualified to vote at that time. And related to point one, as I have up here, uh, the number of House of Representatives was partly a concession to southern slave states. Each slave was counted as three-fifths of a human being, and 40% of the South was comprised of slaves. So this indirectly awarded more electors to the larger southern states. And, uh, so has the Electoral College worked very well? Well, it, it's not. <laughs> For example, out of our first four or five presidents, four of them came from the very large slave state of Virginia. There was a huge benefit, even then, to having a large population state and to having a lot of slaves in that state. And that's why most of our early presidents were, in fact, uh, uh, from Virginia. <clears throat> That's a little bit about from Alexander Hamilton. You can, you can read this thing, and I thought this was kind of interesting because it was rather prescient. I'll just read it to you. The process of election affords a moral certainty that the office of the president will never fall to the lot of any man who is not in an eminent degree endowed with the requisite qualifications. Talents for low intrigue and the little arts of popularity may alone suffice to elevate a man to the first honors in a single state. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> <laughs> Low entry, well said. But it will require other talents and a different kind of merit to establish him, always him, of course, in the esteem and confidence of the whole union, or of so considerable a portion of it as to, it would be necessary to make him a successful candidate for the distinguished office of the President of the United States. That, that was from Alexander Hamilton. Kind of interesting. That, that was the idea of the Electoral College, is to provide that educational buffer. Uh, and uh, there was another slide. He's got out of order somehow. What I like about this is that it's just a reminder that we don't live in a democracy. We do live, if you want to call it a representative democracy, I can live with that. But we really live in a republic. And early on, one of the, uh, one, somebody asked uh, Benjamin Franklin, well, doctor, what have we got, a republic or a monarchy? And his response was, a republic, if you can keep it. So it's quite distinct from a monarchy. <clears throat> okay, let's talk about a couple of the pluses and minuses of the Electoral College. Uh, the idea also was to, to maintain a, quote, federal character in the nation to prevent a urban-centric victory, okay? And it also, another plus was 
It increases the political influence of small states. Some see that as a plus. Some see it as a negative. It also stabilizes the two-party system because it's the states that are given a lot of jurisdiction on how to select. You're yeah. a bit into the Am I standing in the middle of the screen? Your shadow is side of it. My shadow is? Nice left leg. Okay. Move over a little bit. Thank you for telling me. Is that better or not? Yes. It's perfect. Oh my, I'm gonna go home. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, also, uh, it gives flexibility if the candidate dies or is disabled after the vote. That's kind of a minor point. But the point is, if somebody dies or is disabled after the election, well, the electors can choose somebody else, right? And it also isolates some of the electoral problems. I mean, I know that in history, we've had electoral problems, say, uh, well, for example, in the early 60s, Kennedy is widely do, believed to have had his, his presidency stolen for him by Richard J. Daley in Chicago. Okay, LBJ had a lot of ballot stuffing going on in Texas too. You know, so early on, <clears throat> and to this day, if the voter fraud is isolated, we've also had some recent things, that, what is it, in North Carolina? I can't remember that had, that have had some fraud involved. And if it's more isolated to a state or two, then it's easier to, to fix. But if fraud is rampant all over the country, it's a lot harder to hold a whole new election, right? Okay, so some minuses. I think you can imagine some. One is the non-determinacy of the popular vote. Five times we have had presidents elected who have not won at least a plurality of the vote, okay? And I'll talk about that a little bit later. Also, it discourages voter turnout and participation, and I'll talk about that in a minute, too. And uh, voter representation becomes unbalanced. And also, there's an exclusive focus on large swing states. And I'm going to talk about these one at a time. And it obscures disenfranchisement within the states. And also, you may or may not realize it, but like folks in Puerto Rico, they are citizens. but they don't vote in a presidential election because they're part of the territory. There's no electoral votes in Puerto Rico. Interesting. So, uh, let me scroll down, oh, let me go back. Huh. Some reason. So, let's see if I had any notes here. All right, there is a history of so-called faithless electors. About 1% of the time, historically, electors have decided not to vote for what their party in the state dictates. Okay. And this just happened in Washington State in the, last, uh, in the last election, where four of our electors decided not to vote for Hillary Clinton, although the rest of the state did. Uh, anybody happen to know who they voted for? <coughs> anybody remember? Three of them were for Colin Powell. Why Colin Powell? I have no idea. The other one, gosh, I, I might be murdering his name, but it's something like Lone Faith Eagle or, or something like that, who's a uh, Native American activist in the Keystone Pipeline. I think his name is Lone Eagle, something like that. Let's see if I wrote it down here. Yeah, in fact, it, the, the total number of votes I've got here uh, was 538, uh, Donald Trump received 304, Hillary Clinton received 227. It's a lot bigger difference than I remember. Bernie Sanders received one, John Kasich received one, Ron Paul received one, and it was Faith Spotted Eagle received one. So, you know, it's just kind of interesting the, the way this is sorting out. Okay, oh, this is just the list of the five times. Does anybody happen to remember when Al Gore received the uh, majority of the popular vote. And it was really close in Florida. And in the end, it was the Supreme Court who decided who became president. So we got George Bush instead. In 2016, I think most of us know that Hillary Clinton received nearly three million more votes than Donald Trump. And yet, she's not president. Okay. Page down on this. 
So let me talk a little bit about discouragement of voter turnout and participation. Yeah, oh, you can see that pretty well. Here's the problem. Only about half of us vote, like 55% of us or so, actually even bother to vote in, in a presidential election. And you can see, by looking up here, that in the last election, the Republican presidential candidate got 26.5% of the vote, and Clinton got 27.7%. And as they describe in this graphic that I didn't make, these people better start giving shit. <laughs> or this country is going to go down the tubes, in my opinion. We really need to inspire the people, that is like 45% of us, who don't even bother to vote. So why don't they vote? I mean, that, that, that's a question. You know, why don't they vote? And I can give you one reason. Think about for a second if you were a conservative voter living in Kansas or Alabama, does it matter whether you vote? I mean, you know that state is gonna go red, right? Why bother to go down to the ballot box and vote? All right, even worse, let's just say you're a liberal voter in Kansas or in Alabama. You know that state, the state you reside in, is not going to go your way, so why bother to go down to the ballot box? And it, it you know, it doesn't matter whether it's conservative or liberal. For example, in Hawaii, if you live in Hawaii and you're a liberal voter, you know Hawaii is gonna go liberal. Why bother to vote? Okay, if you're a conservative, why bother to vote? You know it's gonna go liberal. So that's part of the thing that's going on is that I think it's very corrosive to voter participation is the electoral college. So. So this is the presidential candidate turnout rates, starting all, all the way from the beginning, uh, all the way to the present day. And there's a couple things I want to point out about this that are kind of interesting. Is, I guess I gotta be near the microphone. <laughs> Look in the very beginning here. You notice that the midterm elections got more votes than the presidential elections up until about, what was it, like 1850 or thereabouts? Do you ever think about why that might be the case? Well, the reason why is because most of our loyalties were not to the United States of America back then. We were a proud Virginian or a proud New Yorker, okay? So the local elections were much more important to us, but starting somewhere Oh, well, about 1850, 1860, somewhere around there. We started to feel more like a, a nation. I mean, early on in the Federalist Papers, they had great discussions about whether this union of colonies at the time was going to hold. I mean, the, the, the United States of America staying united was not a foregone conclusion by any means. And in fact, as, as we all know, that was severely tested during the Civil War. That was the biggest test for the survival of this nation as the United States. And then later on, okay, if you look somewhere around 1925, okay, for some reason, our voter participation went from about 80% down to about 50%, which to me is quite sad. Okay. Now, there is some hope in this chart. Take a look at the very end. You see right, right there. Okay. You see that little upsurge, that little uptick? You know what that is, right? It was the last elections we had. A lot of people seem to be angry about what's going on in politics right now. Okay. So they came out at the midterm elections, and they voted. And that's how the Congress suddenly turned democratic. I hope that keeps happening, okay? I really do. We need to inspire more young people to vote. We need to inspire disenfranchised people from voting, okay? And you know, there's a whole raft of other issues about you know voter suppression and gerrymandering and all kinds of things that are sort of out of the purview here that I, I'll try and answer questions about. I, I'm actually a science geek, not a law geek, but I'm doing my best here. <laughs> So let's see what else we got here. So we'll get to the main top. Oh, 
this, this is really sad. <laughs> this shows proportionally the presidential uh, participations by the candidates in the last election. Okay, and and look look at this chart. It, it's it's embarrassing. There's really only about a dozen or so, ten swing states that are really important. Okay, look at all the time that they spend in Florida. Compare that to California. See that little tiny sliver sliver of California? Take a look at Texas. They spend hardly any time there. Now, I, I think they're going to spend a lot more time in Texas pretty soon because I think it's kind of turning purple. It seems like. But almost all of their time is spent in places like Iowa and New Hampshire, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Virginia, North Carolina, and especially Florida. And all the other states, you can see Washington all the way up in that little corner, get very little visits from the candidates, very little activity. So who's deciding the election? Certainly not the country. It's really 10 states. Sad. Okay, another problem, see if I can figure out how to get to this link. Patrick. Ooh, it worked. Yes. Okay. So th this is not real complicated. I think you can get a general idea of what's going on. The idea behind this is you take the number of votes and you do, in a state and divide it by the number of electoral votes that are in that state, okay? And to give you an example, Wyoming, oops, I gotta go up a little bit, has 142,000, 143,000 people per electoral vote, okay? And compare that to New York, which is 519,000, okay? So in other words, the amount of voting power that is in Wyoming is approximately four times greater than it is in New York in terms of the amount of power that they exercise over the electoral college. And to me, this is fundamentally unfair, okay? But keep in mind, I can make the case, even in a conservative area, that we really should have proportional representation based on per person simply out of fairness. Let, let me get into that. Let me go back to this. Let me get rid of this thing. So this was, uh, let's see what else I got here. Oh, yeah. I want to talk about this a little bit. This is really old data. Actually, it's from 2007, but I don't think it's changed a whole lot. Most people want to get rid of the Electoral College. If you ask them, uh, it's a higher proportion of Democrats, of course. Uh, but even most Republicans and most independents want to get rid of the Electoral College. But here's the rub, okay? To get rid of the Electoral College, which is enshrined in our Constitution, would require a, a constitutional amendment. And getting a constitutional amendment is very difficult. You need to get two-thirds majority of the House of Representatives and two-thirds majority of the Senate and three quarters of the states to ratify it. That's, that's a, a tough hurdle to overcome. The last amendment that we had that was passed successfully was in the early 90s. And it had to do with, uh, with paying our Congress critters that can't collect higher pay until they're reelected. That was back in the early 90s. And the one before that, I think, was way back in the 60s when we gave 18-year-olds the right to vote. Think about that, that's 50 years. It just, just doesn't take, it takes a long time to get one of these things passed. But most people want it. That's the irony of it. So, uh, now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact. And what it is, is it's a grassroots movement to sidestep the onerous <coughs> amendment problem process to essentially put a fork or defang or whatever you want to, however you, colorful metaphor you want to use to get rid of the electoral college. So here's what it is. It's the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact is an agreement among a group of U.S. states in the District of Columbia to award all of their electoral votes to whichever presidential candidate 
wins the overall popular vote in the 50 states in the District of Columbia. I'll let that settle in a little bit. So what that means is that each state, regardless of how they voted in the state, okay, would vote or cast their electoral votes for whoever wins the national popular vote. Okay, so how is this going? All right, it's going really well, I think. This is a really useful graphic. So it started more or less in 2006, as you can see on the, on the lower axis, and Maryland was the first state which passed in both houses of their legislature and was signed by the governor to, uh, to join this compact. Okay, and next was New Jersey, okay, about a year later, and then on up the line, and you'll be happy to know that Washington State, we're, we're yay, Washington State, we did this, okay, a few years ago. And uh, so I can't tell you to go write your legislature, we already won, we already got it. But we're working our way up the chain here. California was a great big one, and the most recent one was just not very long ago, which was Oregon, okay? And that gave us a total of 196 electoral vote equivalents. Now, when we hit 270, it all goes into effect, okay? And we're on our way. I think we're gonna do it, okay? Now there's a few things that you should note about this. Not all of these, but most of these are blue states, okay? And it's a little bit harder to persuade people, say, in Wyoming to surrender their power, okay? They like having more control, and they don't like us city slicker liberal types telling them who should be president. It kind of makes sense on the surface of it. But at the same time, what I know about most conservative people is they at least try to stay, take a stand for fairness and fair-mindedness, okay? And it would resonate with many of them, in my opinion, to realize that each person should have their vote be equal power to everyone else's, okay? And I think that, that that would resonate with some of them. It's a nice little chart, and when we get up to 270, heck, we're, uh, we're two-thirds of the way there, this is gonna go into effect. And it'll be interesting when that happens. Now, okay, so this might be just repetitive. Oh, no, not entirely. The number of electoral vote equivalents enacted is 196, I said that. And the legislation of pending is equivalent to 90 more electoral votes. And uh, then there's some states where it's not enacted or, or pending. And we need to come to full force at 270 votes. Okay. I, I, I got to admit, I, I couldn't figure out this graphic exactly. But this is trying to make the case that the historical advantage of the electoral college relative to the popular vote demonstrates that neither major party holds a consistent advantage. So positive values on this uh, indicate a Republican advantage, and negative values indicate a Democratic advantage. I, I contemplated not showing this slide, because to be honest, I'm not sure what the data are based on exactly. I think it has to do with uh, uh, the number of electoral votes compared to, uh, compared to the popular vote. Okay goes up and down. So there's no clear consistent advantage in the Electoral College for either people of the liberal persuasion or the conservative persuasion. Anyhow. <clears throat> oh, this is just more of the same. I don't know how well you can see that. Oh, it's not too bad. Just showing that California, for example, has an awful lot of voters that are controlling many fewer per voter electoral votes, whereas on the other side is Wyoming relatively much more powerful. In fact, I couldn't find the graphic. I looked all over the place for it. But somebody pointed out that there's like four states, okay? I think it's like Wyoming, Nebraska, you know, those big, sparsely populated states that control as many electoral votes as a couple of counties in California. I don't think Dakota is Vermont. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's kind of amazing, right? All right, get down here. <clears throat> okay, so I'm, I'm kind of done. I just wanted to introduce this to you guys and say that when you're going home for Thanksgiving, if you have a relative who happens to be in one of those other states, 
that uh, has not enacted the National Popular Vote Compact, talk to them about it. Ask them if it's fair that if they're in a rural state, that their, their vote is worth much more than somebody who lives in California or New York or Texas. And uh, I just also wanted to point out that I'm the primary organizer of the Science Seattle Skeptics and Science Enthusiasts Meetup Group. And uh, we actually have another talk about the Electoral College, College, not by me. I'm a science geek. But this guy is Bill Taylor, and he's been teaching political science and history since 1970. And uh, for most of those years at Oakton Community College, and I asked him to give a talk about the Electoral College. And, and he gave me this title. <clears throat> and uh, he teaches locally, too. It's, it's, the title he gave me was, Let's Face It, We're Stuck with the Electoral College. I hope to debate him on that. And he, he, he wrote a description, despite the title, I'll provide a history of the Electoral College and explain how and why it's undemocratic, discuss alternatives, and then conclude by explaining the title. Okay. And we meet at 7 p.m. on the third Tuesday of every month at Razzie's Pizzeria, which is down near 85th and, uh, what's that, Cross Street? Bradley, what's it? Greenwood. 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 That's it, thank you. I knew somebody would remember. And uh, yeah, come and join us. You can join our, our meetup group and, and hear more about it. Okay, I'm just going to conclude with this. If you don't vote, I'm going to come out there and spank you. <laughs> <laughs> I hit hard. And you know, this is, I guess, the right time for this talk because Tuesday is the last day we can vote in this local election. It's not as big of an election as the uh, presidential election, but there's a lot of important issues that we need to look at. And uh, local issues affect you more. They do. I like that. And it's true. It really is true. And uh, one of the problems with, uh, you know, I didn't want to make this a talk about religion because we're not interested in that. One of the problems with evangelicals is they vote. <laughs> okay? More liberal folks tend not to vote. Okay? Now, I know, like I said, there's voter suppression, there's all kinds of problems, there's gerrymandering, there's the United, uh, Citizens United thing and all that. In fact, I'll tell you a story about when I witnessed voter, voter repression. I happened to be flying home to Kansas City, or to my mom's home in Kansas City on the day that Donald Trump was elected. And she picked me up at the airport, okay? And driving from the airport to her house, I saw several poll locations that had people lined up way out the door, okay? Now, as I understand it, and correct me if I'm wrong, if you are in line when the poll shuts down, when, when the voting poll sh shuts down, you're allowed to stay in line, okay, until you get in and vote. But how many people are going to do that? I mean, there's a lot of people that have jobs, they have kids, they, they're, they're tired from working all day. Would you stand in line for three hours to vote? Well, maybe I would, but I'm a geek for this stuff. But most people probably would not. And all I could do is shake my head and say, oh my gosh, it's not like that in Washington State. I voted last week. You know, why can't we do this all over the country? I really think that this whole country is just begging for voter reform. Oh, something I forgot to mention. That the four people that, that voted, the faithless uh, electors from the University of Washington, uh, they got fined. I think it was just a minor amount, like a couple thousand dollars or something. But it went to court, and the Washington State Supreme Court actually ruled eight to one that they had to pay the fine. Okay, so good for them. Yeah. So as best as I can, you know, I'll answer any questions you have about this. I, I, I think I... I, I wanted to explore and get out of my science roots and, and get into government a little bit here. So I have only a kind of a superficial understanding of some of this. But I'll do my best to answer any questions you might have. Yeah, Ruth. Oh, I just want to add, when we get into circle, um, pe people can cede their time for anyone in the circle. And the nice thing is sometimes when you have, you know, 40, 50 people in a room, somebody knows the answer. Well, so let's hope. It's not the only deal. Yeah, let's hope. Thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. I, 
I don't have a question, but I, I want to directly respond to voter suppression. Oh, thanks. Voter, yeah, can we do that in a circle, though? Yeah. Is that a better idea? I, I don't know. Yeah, because I think we need response. Anybody have any questions about what I presented? Well, thanks for your attention. I appreciate it.